welcome again guys let me thank you guys for watching subscribing to my channel liking my videos sharing my videos thank you guys for the support you know if it's, this is your first time to this channel just hit that subscribe button and turn on the post notifications as well you know because content that you're gonna get here will be helpful to you in your science in your chemistry especially all right now today we want to look at writing up a planning and designing lab for seeds for your kids now if you're doing chemistry physics or biology you will be expected to write up a planning and designing lab at some point in time and what i find is that a lot of students you know they have difficulty writing up this lab so i decided i would make this video to help those students who have um, a problem writing up these labs so in this video i will show you the different parts of a planning and designing lab what they mean and what you're expected to do and i'll just use a few examples um, as we go along so let's proceed all right so the first thing you're going to want to do is look at your hypothesis so what is your hypothesis your hypothesis really is an educated guess of what the answer is and you may ask yourself what does this mean so let's look at an example here's an example now does iron rust faster near the sea or in the mountains so that's the problem the problem you're facing is that you're being asked to find out if iron rusts faster near the sea or in the mountains so what do you think the answer is that's what your hypothesis is so my hypothesis here would be that the iron rusts faster near the sea okay now there are a few things about the hypothesis which are important one is that you must take a side you are given two options by the sea or by the mountain you need to choose one one of them i have chosen the the, the um by the sea now the thing about it it doesn't matter which side you choose the important thing is that you need to take a side and second thing is that your hypothesis must be provable or testable i can prove whether or not the iron rusts near the sea so this is a provable statement okay and i've taken a side iron rusts faster near the sea okay so your hypothesis you choose a side and it must be testable those are the two things which are very critical there all right so on to the next thing the next thing is the aim and of course you would have come across aim all the time your aim of course is it begins with two and it tells what you want to achieve or what you want to find out what do i want to find out or achieve so let's look at the example to determine if iron was faster near the sea or in the mountain what are you really trying to find out? and it is clearly there you are trying to determine what um how the iron where the iron rusts faster okay then now onto your apparatus and materials what are these things let's just clarify what apparatus means and what is material so your apparatus really are things that you can reuse like your beaker like your measuring cylinder your pipette your beer these things you can reuse from week to week your materials now are the chemicals which you use you can't reuse those your filter paper you can't reuse those things once you use them it's over they just have to be disposed and that's just a little distinguish, um, distinction between your apparatus and materials. But of course, your apparatus and materials are the things that you're going to need to achieve your objective. That's all these things are. Just the things that you will need to achieve your objective. So having said that, let's press on. So our next thing is now the method. Now, there are a few things about the method which you must pay attention to. All right it must be written in present command tense and it must be in point form that is important must be in point form okay so the method of course are the steps that you will take to achieve your objective all right so you have an objective and you're writing down the steps and you're writing those steps in point form so here's an example fill the beaker with water notice it's not written in past tense it's written in present command i'm telling someone to do something Right? So fill the beaker with water. And that's how you should write your method. So that's step one. Then you go to step two. And that's how you're going to get your point form. 
All right. Now, it is important that your method is logical and feasible. Very important. If it's not logical, if it's not feasible, um, then you're not going to get the marks. In other words, in terms of feasibility, when I finish reading through your method as the examiner, can I achieve the objective which I, you have set out to achieve? If I cannot, it means that it's not feasible. Okay, so therefore you have to make sure your method is logical and feasible. So we're pressing on. Let's look at the next thing now. Wow, the big V, my word. The big V, the variables. This is where a lot of students have a whole lot of problems. The variable section. Now, I just want to simplify this for you. So let's go ahead. All right, so your variables really are things. These are factors which affect your experiment. So we call these things variables in science. And there are about four of them. All right, so you have your manipulated or independent. So some people prefer to say independent, while others prefer manipulated. It's the same thing, really. I prefer manipulated, but hey, that's just me. Then you have your responding or your dependent. Then you have your controlled. And control is really constant as well. And then you have your control. All right, we're going to look at all of these things. Now, so let's proceed. Your manipulated variable, right? This is what you change in your experiment. What am I changing in my experiment? Or what am I really testing in my experiment? That is your manipulated variable. So it is something that you will have to change. Okay, so let's look at our example. Where would iron rust faster? Near the ocean or in the mountains? All right, so watch this now. Here the location changes. Therefore, the manipulated variable is the location. As you can see, we're trying to find out where the iron rusts faster, by the ocean or in the mountain. So we're changing the location. And therefore, our manipulated variable is going to be the location. You don't need to put anything else except the location. All right, so that's understood. All right, so the next one now is your responding variable. Okay, and of course, this is what is affected due to the change you made. Realize a while ago you made a change in the manipulated variable. The manipulated variable is what you change. When you change the manipulated variable, what is affected by that? So let's look at our example. In our example, we change the location. And when we change the location, you need to now ask yourself, what is affected by the change in location? And of course, you get exactly that, the speed at which the iron rusts. And so therefore, the responding variable is the speed at which the iron rusts. That is what will be affected by the change in the location. All right. Hope you guys are getting it. You know what I mean? So moving on now to the next variable, which is our controlled or constant variable, all right? Now your constant variable really is just what you keep constant in your experiment. And you do this to make sure that your experiment is valid um, or fair, really. That's pretty much it why you do that. So in our example, where do the nails rust faster? You can clearly see here that um, certain things must be kept constant. For example, the nature of the nail, the conditions of the nail must be kept constant. The mass of the nail must be kept constant. The kind of nail you're using must be kept constant. And the material which makes the nails must be kept constant. You know what I mean? You can't use five grams of nail for the mountain and two grams for the sea. Somebody might say the, the results you get is based on the mass because you changed up the mass, you know? And you can't use one brand of nail. I really don't know any nail brands. To be honest, you can't use one brand of nail and then use a different brand for the mountain and for the sea because people might say, you know what, it's because of the brand. If you use the same brand, maybe you'd have gotten the same results. You know, so we have to keep these things constant um, when wherever we're doing an experiment to make sure they're valid and fair. So moving on to our next um, variable. Our next variable is the control variable. This really mostly has to do with biological experiments. So this in, um, in biology, this is what you compare your results to. All right. It's the experimental setup, as you can see on the screen, that does not have what you're testing for. OK, so it's your, what you're going to compare your results to. So here's an example. If you're testing the effect of fertilizers on plant growth. 
the plant without the fertilizer would be the control. Remember now, you're testing the effect of fertilizers on plant growth. So one plant would get fertilizer and the other plant would not get any fertilizer. So the plant which does not get the fertilizer would be the control because we're going to compare our results to that plant. You follow me? All right, good. It sounds like you're getting it. Great. So we're moving on now. All right. Next thing now we want to look at is our expected results. Expected. It's not something that you must get, you know. But it's something that you expect to happen, it's something that you're anticipating. All right, so how do we write this? How do we formulate our expected results? First thing, you need to know that these are observations which you expect based on your hypothesis. These observations must be based on your hypothesis. It can't be that you think that more um, the, the nail will rust faster at the seaside, but your expected results is telling me that the nail in the mountains would have more rust you know what i mean it must match your hypothesis and that's exactly what we're going to look at so your example the hypothesis is the iron nail will rust fast by the sea so what's your expected results notice here that we say your expected results should begin with it is expected all right because it's not a definite thing it's not something which must happen you're just expecting it so you begin with it is expected that the iron nail from the seaside will have a greater mass of rust or show more signs of rust. You know what I mean? So you're looking, these are observations. Now you can measure the mass. So that's something you can observe. You can see signs of rusting. So these are observations that you, you're expecting to see based on the fact that you said it would rust faster there. You know, so that's just your expected results. All right. So the next thing now is or data to be collected and this is just really straightforward if you actually did the experiment you know what sort of data would you collect you know what sort of evidence would you collect that you did the experiment and usually this is in the form of a table usually most often than not okay so in our example we would need to record the mass or the appearance of the nail in the two locations that's what we would need to record because that's what we're using to determine where the nail rusts faster. Okay, so now here you have a nice little table to show you what it looks like. So you can see here you have the location over here, seaside mountain. You have the mass of the nail before the experiment because mass is more objective than, than an appearance. You know, um, meaning that if it's five grams, it's five grams, you know. But an appearance could be brown to somebody, to one person, and then it looks copper to someone else. Um, so that's more subjective. But mass is an objective thing. All right. So the mass of the nail before the experiment, the mass of the nail after um, the experiment, you know. And so this is how you would have your data to be collected. Notice here that there is no data in the table. You know, oftentimes students tend to put data in the table. But you can't put data in the table without having done an experiment. Where did you get that data from? You know, so you must not put data in the table. Leave it blank. All you're doing for the table is just showing how you would record the results, not recording results. You show how you would record the results. Right? That's your data to be collected. And we're moving on now. So your assumptions, which is a very big thing, a huge thing. It's difficult. I must say assumptions are the most difficult things in um, planning and designing labs. But I'll try and simplify it for you. All right. So here's the deal. You assume that the only thing, the thing that you are testing is the only thing that will um, affect your results. Now, notice here that the thing that you are testing is the manipulated variable. Right? And you're assuming that this thing that you are changing is the only thing that will affect your results. It's the only thing that will cause a change, okay, in your experiment. So to identify your assumption, to get it so you can write it down, because you're, you're going to get a mark for it. You need to be able to identify it and be able to write it down. All you need to do is just state a factor which is not your manipulated or controlled variable, okay? You're going to find something which is a factor variable in the experiment that is not your manipulated variable or is not a controlled variable, right? 
So something that you should keep constant. You're not going to use that as your manipulative variable necessarily. Okay? So it's difficult assumptions. It's something that you have to think through, something that you have to know exactly what you're doing to be able to get, you know? So here's a nice little example. You're, in, you're investigating the effect of exercise on pulse rate, which is a biological thing, um, really. Now, you're going to assume that the subject, the person doing the exercise, that you're going to check their pulse rate before exercise and then after exercise. So that person is the subject. You're going to assume that they have no underlying respiratory conditions, you know, like asthma. You're going to make that assumption because you don't know for sure. You know, they could look like they're healthy, but they could be very ill. You don't know, God forbid. You know, so you're going to make an assumption. All right. So you're not manipulating the person in that regard. You're just, and that's not something you can control. So this is your assumption that this person has no respiratory condition, such as asthma, for example. All right. So we're moving on nicely. Hope you guys are getting it. Now your precautions. This is just pretty straightforward. Precautions, simple. Things, steps that you take to make, ensure you get valid and reliable results. All right? So you're doing things which make sure you get good results. You don't want to get bad results. And usually these things, you don't want it to be an indictment to you. You know what I mean? You want to make sure that these things are things which you do properly. For example, you don't want to be using a measuring cylinder and you place and you hold the measuring cylinder in your hand. You want to ensure that you place the measuring cylinder on a flat surface and you read it at eye level. All right. You want to make sure that you do that because this is a precaution to ensure you get good results. You follow me? All right. We're almost there. Almost there. Almost there. Stay with me now. Almost there. All right. So. The last one, sources of errors or limitations. These two things are actually the same thing. Sometimes we give it as two different things, but they're really the same thing, you know? Sources of error or limitations. And of course, these are things which you cannot control or you cannot change them, but they will affect your results. They will cause some problems for you in your experiment, right? So these are limitations. They, they prevent you from getting the best result possible, okay? Or the, the, the optimum result, so to speak, yeah. So here's an example now. An examples of um, sources of errors for chemistry, you have your endpoint error. This is mostly for CAPE students because CSEC students don't really, they're not really taught about the endpoint error, really. That's a, that's a limitation. That's something which is intrinsic to the... Um, to the methodology of titrations or volumetric analysis, you know? So that's something that you can't help, you can't prevent that, you can't stop it, yeah? Not being able to prevent heat loss in an energetic experiment. You do an experiment and you apply, you add heat to a calorimeter, heat is being lost. It's really difficult to prevent heat loss because chances are you have to put that thermometer inside and there's going to be a little space where the what the heat of the gases can escape through that um, little hole there. So you can't prevent that. It's so difficult. You know, and if a subject has asthma, as we mentioned before, this is something you can't do anything about. They're supposed to exercise. They have asthma. Asthma affects their respiratory rate, you know, and um, or their breathing rate. Sorry, not respiratory rate. Their breathing rate or their pulse rate, heartbeat, so to speak. And, um, there's nothing you can do about that. You can't say, okay, John, we're going to be doing um, the effect of exercise on breathing rate today. So you need to just get rid of your asthma for the exercise. It doesn't work like that. So there's nothing you can do about that. You know what I mean? So there you have it. Um, these are the things that we're looking for when we ask you to write up a planning and designing lab. These are the things which students find most difficult. You know what I mean? So, but I hope you have found this helpful. I hope you this will help you when you're doing chemistry, physics, or biology. I hope it will help you when you are writing up your lab so that you can get that the highest grade possible. You know, please like, share, subscribe to my channel. Give the video, video a thumbs up if you found it to be helpful. You know, and yeah, all the best in your studies, and I'll see you next time. Thank you for watching.